Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, today we have Chris Mitch, who is a historian and philosopher now at Booknow University. Chris works in the philosophy of physics, philosophy of mathematics, and feminist philosophy, and has recently written a paper co-authored with Marion Gilton and David Freeborn on possible responses to Hag's theorem in quantum field theory. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what exactly Chris has to say, so please uh, take it away. Um, thank you, um, and thank you everyone for having me here. Um, I am delighted and terrified to be the first philosopher that you are having in this group, so um, this will be fun. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk uh, predominantly about Hogg's theorem um, and trying to draw some lessons um, from the history of the theorem, reactions to the theorem um, in general. And uh, I'll put up front my target for today um, is not exactly to cover the, the details of Hogg's theorem or the precise details of the reactions. It is this kind of more general question of how can philosophy fruitfully interact with physics? And uh, for this group in particular, I feel comfortable just saying, frankly, I think a lot of philosophy of physics is garbage um, and not worth engaging with. Um, and so I am interested, and I think David and Marion are also quite interested in figuring out what does it look like for philosophy to uh, engage fruitfully with ongoing physics. Um, so we have picked Hogg's theorem kind of as a test case here, and it was very convenient that this summer, um, actually shortly before or after, I can't remember, uh, I guess before, um, the paper we had been working on for a while got published. Um, big discussion of this on Twitter. Um, big by research community standards, not by Twitter standards, um, uh, kicked off by um, someone who just asked uh, quantum field theorists, what do you all think of Hogg's theorem? What do you all think Hogg's of Hogg's theorem, which says the interaction picture does not exist in field theories? Is it useful, interesting, or essentially inconsequential? Is there a workaround? Um, and there are quite a number of responses to this. Um, but I think one of the respondents captured the vibes of the discussion quite nicely um, and humorously um, that a lot of physicists were pretty quickly dismissing Hogg's theorem as irrelevant um, and coming to the defense of uh, QFT uh, against the onslaught of these mathematicians insisting on bringing rigor to uh, the conversations. Um, so what? So like, how should we react to this? We might just think, well, let's just decide who's right about Hogg's theorem. Is it the mathematicians? Uh, is it the groups of physicists who are each suggesting a, a number of different responses uh, to the situation? Um, or, and uh, spoiler, I think this is the direction we all go. Uh, I think there are some other lessons that we could perhaps draw from uh, the situation, uh, Hogg's theorem and the, the responses there too. Um, and I'll just put these up front. So I think there are two big lessons we can draw here. One is that at least philosophers are not asking the right questions uh, about Hogg's theorem. Um, I think they're just off track. Um, the second, uh, and this is a little more tentative, I'm going to talk through this in the second portions of the talk, um, at least among philosophers, again, a, a lot of our discussion so far has been aimed at philosophers, so apologies for the, the uh, um, targeting there, but um, no-go theorems tend to get a fairly bad rap because at least philosophers, I think, have frankly weird expectations of what they're going to give us. Um, and so I'm going to talk about um, kind of what counts as foundational work in general? What are we focusing on when we say something is foundational? Uh, theorems, are we thinking about reasoning? 
Um, and then the second portion, I'm going to talk about what is significant about no-go theorems. And I'm going to uh, make a suggestion for one way um, these things might be useful uh, in ongoing research. And uh, I'll just flag that um, the first part of the talk corresponds to a paper that uh, Marion, David, and I uh, just published fairly recently um, that uh, Evan alluded to in, in the opening here. Um, and then the second portion of the talk is going to correspond more or less to um, a follow-up paper that we're still kind of fleshing out. So actually a discussion um, on the second would be especially useful. Um, of course, discussion on the first as well, but um, especially useful for the second. Um, so I'm just going to jump in here uh, to the first part of the talk here, which corresponds to that, that first um, paper. And... Our guiding question for this was, what does Hogg's theorem tell us about quantum field theory? Um, present state of quantum field theory or the future of quantum field theory? And this is going to bring us to, I think, our, our first lesson here. So I'll, I'll just give a, a crude history here of uh, the theorem. Um, in general, speaking very roughly here, we had uh, two approaches to quantum field theory um, in the 30s and 40s and early 50s. One, uh, we could call it canonical QFT, essentially relied on combining Feynman's rules with the Tomonaga-Schwinger formalism. Um, and here the focus was on um, free asymptotic states and a major tool there was the interaction picture, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about in, in a moment. Um, but the big upshot of this approach was great. Now we have scattering amplitudes that we can actually calculate and are quite useful. Um, on the other hand, um, we had a program that led um, from uh, von Neumann and um, Dirac into Figner and onward from there, um, focused on more formal variants of quantum field theory. Uh, of course, this program has continued on in many, many directions. Both of them have. Um, but at the time, um, we were focused on irreducible Hilbert space representations of the Poincaré group. Um, and the focus was on trying to get an instantaneous state description that was workable throughout the entire interaction. And at that point, we were working with tools like unitary intertwiners and infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces were uh, an essential tool here. The upshot from that program, or one of the upshots uh, from that program um, that we started to really pick up on in the early 50s and mid 50s, uh, of which the hog, and I'm going to add Hall and Whiteman there because they sort of cleaned up um, uh, some of the details of the uh, Hogg's theorem. Um, upshot of all of this was the recognition of the importance of unitarily and equivalent representations. Um, so we have, on the one hand, usable scattering amplitudes, on the other, this Hogg's theorem business um, and um, inequivalent representations business. And the question is what to do with that. Um, so just to quickly run through, I'm not gonna read all of these here. We had, um, going into Hogg's theorem, we had a number of what seemed to be fairly reasonable assumptions about um, states, about fields, and uh, about um, the um, um, uh, uh, interactions among these. Um, so things like that they form a separable, Hil separable Hilbert space carrying a unitary representation of the Poincaré group, um, irreducible, um, or that there's a unique vacuum state. Um, and for fields, making some of the classic assumptions um, that they're represented by unbounded operators defined on dense subsets of Hilbert spaces. Um, and the key one here that um, Hogg brings in is um, how do we understand the interaction picture? How is it that we're representing the interacting field? In particular, it's going to be represented using the interaction picture. Well, what's the interaction picture? Uh, this is, again, probably all super familiar to everyone. So 
I'm not going to spend a ton of time, but, you know, super basic. We had the Schrodinger picture. We had the Heisenberg picture. Schrodinger picture is, you know, great for calculating, but relativistic symmetries are kind of a mess to deal with. Um, Heisenberg picture, kind of the opposite. Symmetries are fairly transparent, but calculating is very difficult. And so uh, Dirac develops a middle ground here, and it turns out to be incredibly useful in field theory in particular. Um, and we essentially treat the interactions like a perturbation from a free field. Um, and this allows us to do things like, say, represent the uh, scattering amplitude of a multiparticle state alpha um, as time evolving to some other multiparticle out state beta by right, the field using tools like you see here. Um, and this is great because uh, the interpolating field now is modeled as a Heisenberg field um, for reasons thrown up there. Awesome. We know how to work with this. Um, and it also allows the free and interacting states to occupy the same state, pace, state space. Um, that is, there's, there seems to be a unitary intertwiner between the free and interacting state spaces often called the Dyson operator, Dyson matrix. Okay, great. Uh, this seems awesome. Um, problem, uh, Hogg's theorem. Uh, so uh, suppose uh, that these um, two different uh, uh, fields, um, the free field and interacting field are so related uh, by the Dyson operator. Uh, that matrix cannot exist um, uh, if uh, the interacting field is truly interacting. Uh, more or less, they, they collapse. Um, they're both free fields if you have two separate fields. That's not great. Um, so we've had a number of reactions to this situation over the years, uh, just pulling a few from um, more recent literature. Um, one reaction is, okay, well, uh, on any reading of Hogg's theorem, um, the interaction picture is undermined and the attendant approach to scattering theory is undermined. Okay, so that sounds like, oh crap, the interaction picture is fundamentally broken. Um, but on the other hand, um, so that's a classic paper on Hogg's theorem, 2006 by um, John Ehrman and Doreen Fraser. Um, on the other hand, we have folks like Tony Duncan saying things like, well, uh, regularization uh, restores applicability of the interaction picture. So the interaction picture is just fine. Thank you very much. Um, and we have a similar sort of like disagreement, it would seem, over, say, the status of particles. Um, you have folks like Halverson and Clifton, and Doreen Fraser um, picks up on this line of reasoning a little bit later. Um, saying that really what we need to do is banish the particle interpretation, where you need to interpret these as fields. So the particle talk is just a facade. Um, of course, um, Ruth Kastner then says, like, actually, it's fields that are the problem, and we need to get rid of those. And so at least a cursory look at the literature suggests, like, okay, this is kind of a mess. It's not clear what's going on here. Are these folks genuinely disagreeing? Um, well, luckily, a uh, little more thorough look reveals, actually, there are some points of agreement here that are fairly substantial uh, that at least give us a, a starting point to figure out what the heck's going on here. Um, so everyone seems to agree that particle physics is successful by its own standards. We're not criticizing uh, particle physics um, per se. Um, there's a question of, is this the right standard? Um, should we be holding particle physics to a higher standard? Uh, we're dealing with low order pertur perturbative approximations and we know that the full series diverges. So can we or should we expect more here? Um, on the other hand, folks agree that Hogg's theorem presents a bona fide problem for using the interaction picture to relate distinct fields, at least in the kind of standard textbook fashion. Um, and uh, we seem to agree, many folks seem to agree that there's fairly intuitive appeal of the time evolution of the full state space, which is what the interaction 
picture purported to deliver for us. Um, but uh, in responding, you should think about like what would count as a fully satisfactory theory. Do we need that time evolution of the full state space or can we satisfy ourselves with something less? So those at least give us some purchase here on, on looking at this conversation at large. And what we tried to do was put together a framework to understand, okay, how do all of these various responses relate to one another? And we had a couple of goals in putting this framework together. One was, frankly, just to organize them and bring a little bit of order to the responses that were already out there. Because it's as uh, we saw with some of the quotes earlier, it can be quite challenging to find the exact points of disagreement um, in the literature. It, it can often seem like there's substantial disagreement and then you read closer and it's like, oh, actually you're describing a couple things just slightly differently and these fit together just fine. Um, so we were trying to bring some organization to these responses and make the, the various assumptions more transparent. Um, but we also wanted to make a, uh, some room for uh, new or different responses that are not yet represented in the literature. I'm confident there are others out there um, that have not been uh, directed uh, at Hogg's theorem, Hogg's theorem per se. Um, so we surveyed papers that were directly addressing Hogg's theorem, which is going to leave out a ton of things, but it was enough to get a start. Um, and so we developed a, like a, a structure for this uh, framework with just some probative questions. Um, so first, what is this particular author's assessment of Hogg's theorem in the sense of like, what precisely is the problem or what are the problems posed by Hogg's theorem? Um, and what objectives are these a problem for? Um, and then, okay, having that um, already down, like, how should we remediate this? What should be repaired um, about QFT? Um, and longer term, what are we hoping for here? In particular, where should resources um, for the next phase of research be allocated um, uh, given this uh, situation? Uh, so this was the, the framework we used to assess um, a, a handful of responses to Hogg's theorem. And I won't go through all of these, um, but I will highlight here, um, uh, as I did earlier, the uh, John Ehrman and Dorian Fraser. Their assessment is that the interaction picture rests on a set of inconsistent assumptions and suggests that, at least in the short term, uh, the repair we should make is to just abandon the interaction picture and uh, adopt Hogg rule. Uh, that's kind of the, the final conclusion, but they also discuss a, a couple other options that seem um, somewhat viable. And long term, what they're hoping for is uh, an interpretation uh, to be delivered from formal variants uh, of quantum field theory. Um, in contrast, though, uh, Tony Duncan uh, makes it fairly clear um, that, uh, look, what's at concern uh, at issue here is the interaction picture pre-renormalization. Um, and regularization and renormalization just take care of this already. Things we're already doing take care of the problems posed by Hogg's theorem. Um, and um, Tony Duncan and uh, Mike Miller both suggest that, well, look, what we're doing is, is breaking Poincaré uh, invariance in particular. And so their kind of longer term plans are like, we don't really need to do that much. Um, we can keep on keeping on with the regularization and renormalization techniques that we're already using successfully. Um, and I think if we drill in here, what we see is actually a quite wide separation in uh, the aims of these various authors, uh, Tony Duncan and Doreen Fraser in particular, I will highlight here as, as an example. So uh, Doreen just flat out says that uh, 
renormalization and cutoff and regularization techniques do not address the root cause of the problem raised by Hogg's theorem. Um, and that uh, what we need is a correct formulation of quantum field theory, a correct formulation of quant QFT itself. Um, and the formal variants, uh, she's thinking in particular here of things like constructive QFT, um, are the only variants that satisfy this criterion. They're the only ones uh, meeting the standards that we expect um, for these theories or should expect um, for theories. But, right, Tony Duncan um, uh, is quite clear that um, standard canonical approach to quantum field theory is the most powerful, beautiful, and effective theoretical edifice ever constructed in the physical sciences, right? It's just fine. Um, his goal, uh, in particular, his discussion of Hogg's theorem, is really just to provide a, a deep and satisfying comprehension of QFT as it already exists. And so I think what this highlights here is we have some wide variation in thinking about what we want from QFT, um, what we're bringing to our evaluation of Hogg's theorem. Um, we called these getting cute, extra Hoggian outlooks. Um, but really the idea here is capturing like what is coming into everyone's evaluation of quantum field theory or sorry, Hogg's theorem in particular. Um, and so Ehrman and Fraser are really just, they're out to figure out what are the assumptions that characterize quantum field theory. Um, we need well-defined representations of interactions. Um, Duncan and Miller are really just out uh, to figure out, what we know that the predictions are reliable. Uh, why are they reliable? Uh, and these lead to quite different uh, takeaways um, from Hogg's theorem in particular, they're playing, I think, just they're up to very different things. Um, so I'm, I'm pulling diagrams and tables here from, from the paper. Um, and um, I won't run through it, but um, folks can take a look at, at those for further details. Um, okay, so folks have different outlooks. They're bringing different things to the table when they're evaluating Hogg's theorem. Who gives a shit? Like, why does this matter? Um, so what? Um, I think, at least among philosophers, one of the, if not the biggest reaction is, let a hundred flowers bloom. Great, we have a bunch of different responses and isn't that wonderful? Um, and like, sure, great. I think we agree to a substantial extent here, but like, we are constrained resource-wise. We only have so much time. We only have so much money. We're all fighting for funding, right? Um, we can't support 100 flowers indefinitely. We can't support all of these different responses. Um, we have to make choices. And so uh, the question is, which choices do we make? Um, and uh, this is more directed at our philosophical colleagues um, these are the sorts of discussions that we should probably be engaging in. Now, I, uh, this is actually where I would be curious to hear uh, folks' reaction here. Um, does this seem like useful conversation points here? Uh, in particular, um, I'm thinking here, the, the interaction that we might have between physics and philosophy. And I'll, I'll say at least one of the things that I think David and Mary and I take away from this is Y'all are making choices. Um, we need to learn from you what choices are being made. And we'd be curious to learn, like, how are those choices decided? Like, how do you decide on um, a dedication of certain um, resources like time or energy or funding, right? Um, the kind of more humble direction is, like, just asking, like, do philosophers have training or ideas out there or historical knowledge that would be useful in making these decisions? I just anecdotally can say that I've had conversations with um, folks in uh, high energy physics uh, about some of these things. And I've 
will often hear historical arguments about like, look, you know, we tried this in the 30s, and so why not try a similar thing now? Um, and I can also tell you that the history is wrong uh, in some of those retellings. Uh, does that matter? Maybe it doesn't matter, right? Um, but perhaps it does. Uh, and perhaps this is a place that um, historians um, and philosophers might be able to, to contribute, um, not override anything, but um, provide some more information that would be useful for making these these decisions that are already happening. Um, and we sort of started off um, this project by recognizing there seemed to be a number of kind of big, seemingly big picture questions about Hogg's theorem. Um, does the interaction picture exist? Is particle physics particle physics? Is it really about particles? What is relativistic quantum field theory? Um, and I think what we found is actually there are more interesting methodological questions underlying these sorts of things. Yeah, okay, we can you know talk about does the interaction picture exist, but really what seems interesting here is um, are we satisfied if all we have is a non-perturbative structure for quantum field theory? It seems to me there are diverging opinions on this. Um, why and where do we want a well-defined intertwiner? Are I are safe and scale relative observables enough? Are we satisfied with that? Um, or do we want something more? Or uh, relating to uh, particle interpretation, is the free field notion the one we want to be using for interaction? Does that seem like the appropriate concept? Uh, and a lot of the literature, at least in the philosophical end, uh, concluding that particles don't exist, is drawing on something like the, the free field representation, the good old number operator way of understanding um, uh, particles um, in free fields. And okay, when should we be satisfied with the formalism's representational transparency? Let's say that um, you know, QFD in fact should be interpreted as about particles. Are we satisfied with the way that it represents the situation? Is it kind of wearing its interpretation close enough to the surface? Um, and um, also some bigger picture questions about method. So like, why axiomatize at all? What should we expect of axiomatization? And how should these um, more formal approaches, algebraic approaches, interface with more traditional approaches to quantum field theory? These seem to us like more interesting questions. And so when folks have been, we've heard many folks ask, like how foundational is Hogg's theorem to quantum field theory really? Um, implication usually being who gives a shit, it doesn't matter. Um, and I think there's a sense in which that's right. I think that like the usual way folks are understanding this question is how foundational is the theorem itself? Um, do we need to worry about the phenomena that Hogg's theorem is directly concerned with? Do we need to keep it in focus um, in our research programs? Should it be guiding research programs? And I think the answer is frankly, like no. In a lot of um, in a lot of work, Hogg's theorem just doesn't matter all that much. I think there are some places that uh, it is worth keeping uh, in view, um, but I think. A more interesting question to be asking about Hogg's theorem, and this is part of why we picked Hogg's theorem, um, is how important is the reasoning um, that went into Hogg's theorem, reasoning of that sort, kind of abstracted away from particular situations, making some assumptions that seem like, yeah, you know, on the whole, that seems like a reasonable assumption, but I can think of several places that it's not going to apply. So, in general, this kind of more abstracted reasoning style. Um, how important is that? That seems like a more interesting question to us than asking how important is Hogg's theorem per se. Um, and so asking questions like what role does or should foundational reasoning, kind of like what went into Hogg's theorem, um, play in physics? Uh, how does or should foundational reasoning coordinate with um, non-foundational work, um, whether that be um, model building or um, uh, particular calculational work. Um, 
And what does that reasoning even look like? What does it mean to call something foundational? Um, what does it look like to engage in foundational reasoning? And so I think stepping back to draw a first lesson from Hogg's theorem, I think if we ask, what does Hogg's theorem tell us about QFT present and future? Um, the traditional response is, well, not much. Like, it's not all that useful. I think that's focusing on the wrong question here. Um, I think, uh, especially among philosophers, we've just been looking at this the wrong way. Um, really, what we should be thinking about is um, uh, the role of foundational reasoning um, in general. Um, OK, so that's kind of the first lesson we extracted. This is really. Uh, in that first paper there. Now I'm going to talk about some more in-progress tentative stuff. And um, apologies, I am going to have to bring in some not physics um, because we're still trying to flesh out um, what we think about this situation. Um, so a uh, second thing I wanted to talk about today was um, what is the significance of no-go theorems? Right, we've already covered Hogg's theorem in particular, and it's taken us to thinking about foundational reasoning. Um, can we flesh out what we mean by foundational reasoning a little bit more? And I think we could say something. Um, so the usual story that folks give, say, if we're looking at Bell's theorem or or something of this sort, is that no-go results are significant because they tell us what we can't have. They tell us take these assumptions with this conclusion, you can't get it. You need to drop at least one of those assumptions. Um, just to give it a cute name, let's call this the what not view. It's the one where take all of these things, you can't have all of them. You need to drop at least one. Um, that seems fine in a number of ways, um, but I do think there's a bit of a problem here. And I'm, I'm hoping that what we are saying here is, is going to sound like common sense. Because um, frankly, uh, this is somewhat heretical in philosophical circles, at least. Um, so I, I'm hoping to come away in this paper with a common sense view. Um, we think uh, philosophers and I think a number of um, uh, folks out in the field here make a couple of mistakes when they approach no-go theorems and thinking about why they are or are not significant. I think the first one is uh, really just taking the assumptions at face value and thinking like, okay, yeah, these all seem reasonable. Shit, we can't have that conclusion. Um, I think the second mistake is to think that these conclusions neatly capture what we're actually after. Um, I think that's often not the case. It can often be a stepping stone towards a thing that we really want. Um, but uh, spoiler, I think often what we find is we can restate the conclusion in a different way um, that still satisfies our original goal um, and avoids the no-go theorem. And so I think in general, um, the, the issue that we've identified, at least among philosophers, is that um, we often focus too much on kind of the statement itself, focus on the, the specific assumptions and the specific conclusion that go into it. And maybe we wander a little bit away from those assumptions, a little bit away from that conclusion, but we're not really focusing on the role that theorems like this play in the development um, of theories. And so I want to present a, um, I don't know if it's a comparison or a contrast, but a different no-go theorem in a very different context uh, and tell a bit of a story about what this um, theorem really did for us. And I'll, I'll try to run through this quickly, um, but it's going to be about sustainable forest management, which I think is, is quite removed from um, the context of concern here. So, all right, um, super basic. Um, we're trying to lease some land in this random part of Wyoming. We have a national park. Um, some local developers approach and say, hey, like, we'd like to lease that land and uh, drill for oil and natural gas. Can we lease that? Here's a proposal. Um, 
And in the US, this is controlled by the US Department of Agriculture's Forest Service. So this proposal comes to them and they're like, what do we do? Well, uh, historically, they could do whatever the hell they want. It was a boys club. They just kind of got together in the cigar lounge and hashed it out and done. Uh, we don't have to do much. Bunch of problems uh, in the 60s and 70s. And we have some new laws come in that essentially say, hey, like you actually need to get participant input um, when you are developing these plans because you've cost us a shit ton of money in legal fights. Um, so you need to actually think about folks who are affected here. Um, and for decades, actually continuing until the present, um, folks have been trying to figure out how do we actually engage um, constituents um, in this process. Um, the problem is um, social choice theory, uh, essentially a way of representing voters' preferences and trying to aggregate all of that information and come up with uh, an aggregate preference um, seems appropriate here. This is a problem because um, several conditions are met here um, that lead to a no-go theorem. Uh, so uh, basically we have at least three alternatives, uh, three different options that the Forest Service might choose from um, when they choose the, the plan to move forward with. Um, Given that, um, there is no way to aggregate and come up with an aggregate preference. Um, and you might think, uh, looking at that, that economists took this to rule out democracy. Um, some folks actually have gone so far as to say that, but uh, they are an extreme minority. Um, or that the Forest Service in particular, um, they, they, they chugged right along, ignored this. Um, you might think, they see it as just simply irrelevant. Um, but uh, the problem here is, right, like if we think of this, the the, the various uh, assumptions that go into this theorem um, as something like a, a, a combination lock, look, you can turn each of the dials. Maybe you can weaken one of the assumptions. Uh, maybe you can get rid of it entirely. Maybe they aren't independent and you can um, absorb the, the part you really need of one of the assumptions into one of the others. You have a ton of freedom here. Um, and it turns out that flip a few of these dials and all of a sudden Arrow's theorem is not really a problem. You can still find a, um, an aggregation procedure um, just fine. Um, and in fact, what happened is not only did folks play with the dial, we came up with a ton of different voting aggregation methods um, and developed a ton of criteria that seemed to capture our idea of what it means um, to implement like democratic decision making. So um, this is a brief summary on Wikipedia of like a small portion of the literature on um, social choice theory and developing responses um, to this situation. Um, so I think one lesson we can pull from this um, is just that these often tell us uh, where you can start um, when you are, are trying to um, further investigate the, investigate the framework that you are working with. Um, these little dials here, um, tell you exactly where you can you can flip and make different choices. Um, that's kind of what we saw um, in, in the decades after that. Um, I think the second thing we can learn from this case uh, is that uh, the conclusion doesn't necessarily capture what we're after. Um, and so one way of seeing this is uh, we might be able to develop uh, an aggregation procedure that runs in you know, non-polynomial time and takes freaking forever to implement. That's not particularly useful um, when we have, um, say, you know, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million, 10 million folks um, votes that we are trying to aggregate. If it takes forever, it's just not useful. And so you have further constraints being placed on um, what we get out of the assumptions that we were making uh, for these uh, particular frameworks. Uh, and this is something we saw here. Um, and it can also call us back to um, 
like the original goal. So like we had talked about like, yeah, we gave this cute example of like leasing um, land. Um, and we said, well, what they want to do is just find a plan to move forward with. Well, that's not quite it, right? Um, we can come up with all sorts of plans. Uh, the US comes up with all sorts of outcomes in elections. And that does not mean that they are the ideal outcome, right? Um, what we actually want, if we're, we're kind of sitting in the forest services shoes, is we want to come up with a plan that works well enough that it can actually be implemented efficiently and fairly indefinitely. We're not going to have to keep flip-flopping on plans. Um, and so I think what this tells us is if like we pay attention to the restrictions that we're placing and all of the processes that are happening along the way, um, the conclusion may not be the conclusion of that original no-go theorem, you can't have a democratic um, aggregation procedure, just may not be representing what we're actually after. Um, we may be after something more specific. And so I think we can think of this as placing constraints on model adequacy. Um, we had some fairly vague general uh, constraints on model adequacy. Look, we'd like any procedure at all, but we might have further constraints that are coming from the way the, that we implement these models or other contextual factors in addition to um, facts about the exact mathematical model that we are using. Um, and so I think what we kind of came away from this case uh, thinking is uh, capturing these um, constraints more exactly can give us uh, a nice way to bring uh, more precise results, organization, new tools to actual development of models, and can also give us a way to pull some of the conceptual developments that are happening in actual model development um, back into the mathematical models. And this is something that we saw historically in this particular case, is there was this nice flow back and forth between development of very specific models and reasoning about those and um, developments at a fairly abstract or you might call foundational level. There was this nice synergy um, between the, the two uh, camps here. And so jumping back to Hogg's theorem for, for just a moment here, um, this is something um, some folks uh, that we surveyed in that first paper are making some much more radical suggestions uh, about how we might modify quantum field theory. Um, but some folks, like I, I think Klesinski would fall into this camp, um, are much more interested in thinking carefully about um, what is it we want out of um, the tools that we already have at our disposal. Do we have a way of representing these um, better than we already do or in a different way uh, than we already do? And so I think in um, quantum field theory, I think we're, we have a very similar situation where we actually have quite a bit of freedom here to play around with the constraints um, and an opportunity for this sort of synergy back and forth between um, more abstract or what we might call foundational reasoning and development of, of fairly particular um, models. And I think a lot of that is, is happening in practice um, and it's getting missed um, when we talk about these no-go theorems. Um, and I think they, they play a fairly important role here. And so I think the, the way we've tentatively summarized this is that um, these things function kind of combinatorially, right? Uh, the assumptions um, and conclusion of a no-go theorem. Look, we can swap them in and out relatively easily, um, but also uh, they can be um, uh, quite useful mechanisms for calling our attention to back, uh, calling our attention back to the, the purposes that we um, had sort of uh, given to the this, um, area to begin with. Um, and so uh, our rough thinking is that by analogy with Hogg's theorem, or sorry, Arrow's theorem, uh, something similar um, may be appropriate for describing Hogg's theorem. Um, and so it's to step back here and think about like, what is the, the second lesson that we, we are thinking about here? Um, what is it that makes no-go results useful? Well, I think one kind of cluster of suggestions that we've come up with is 
they can help us narrow down paths that we think are worthy of further development. Um, they can highlight techniques or proof strategies or mathematical concepts that could be useful. Um, and they can also help us coordinate um, with people who are building and deploying these models, um, uh, particularly as a way to organize the principles that are already guiding the model development and deployment. Um, so we think no-go theorems in particular might be able to play uh, more of a role than kind of a, a standard um, go theorem, you might call it. Um, but in general, the idea we kind of came away with was um, these no-go theorems seem to facilitate theoretical development by in some sense consolidating larger swaths of the theoretical landscape and pulling a lot of ingredients together um, and giving you a nice kind of confluence point of all of these things. Um, so that's kind of the tentative thing we've come away thinking about. Um, and uh, just to pull these two lessons back together, I think they uh, sort of fit together nicely. Uh, so our, our first lesson that we drew um, was really what we should be focusing on is questions like how important is foundational reasoning like that, which led to Hogg's theorem. Um, and here the suggestion is the, the second lesson is that uh, No-go theorems are more significant for what we've been calling how-to implications, kind of how to proceed with research or develop a particular theory or integrate uh, a, an area uh, of model development. Um, th those sorts of things are more significant than our um, what we've been calling the what-not implications, just the bare reading of the no-go theorem that says you can't have these and this conclusion. Um, that's not quite as interesting. Um, we think, or as significant as the more methodological implications of these sorts of things. Um, do I have anything else? I think that is basically it. So, okay, sorry to end on kind of a, a weird note there, but um, these are the things that I was hoping to, to have some discussion about. So uh, thank you, everyone. Excellent, thank you. Um, I did have a quick question immediately on the end of your, your first part, which was, um, uh, on this sort of, what would a research program look like, um, addressing Hag's theorem and, and such, and, you know, should we care about it, um, especially in the context of physics? And I immediately thought, um, to the case of Minkowski space time versus Rindler space time, where you have different mm. unitarily equivalent vacua, which is very close, I think, to what Hag's theorem is getting at. But in contrast to Hag's theorem, um, there is, I'd say, a very big, or this was a very big research program trying to address this in physics, namely through detector models and trying to understand things in operational terms. And that has also been developed a bit on the side of philosophy. Um, I guess from that perspective, and you might disagree, but is it that you need a very pragmatic reason to care about um, these issues to see, it, on the physics side, to see a problem that needs to be addressed? Um, and does Hugs there not pose these pragmatic difficulties? Yeah, so uh, first, if I could ask a follow-up question just to make sure I, I, I'm understanding. So are, are we drawing a contrast here between Hogg's theorem um, and uh, the program um, uh, develop kind of uh, working with uh, Rindler instead of, okay. Yeah, that's um, what I'm, I'm trying to do. So we have unitarily inequivalent uh, free vacua versus interacting vacua versus mm -hmm. um, the Minkowski vacuum versus the Vindler vacuum. Yeah. So, what to say about that? I mean, I like. I, I guess I'm not totally sure what to say. Uh, partly because, like, I don't disagree um, mm -hmm. there. I think what what I'd be interested in looking at there is 
um, and may maybe you know you can tell me a bit about this, the historical development of that that program. Because um, my sense would have been that um, my guess would have been that there there's probably substantial overlap between um, kind of the research program that led up to Hogg's theorem and um, uh, the program you're describing. Um, I don't know too much about the history in the connection there, only that it, it arose from uh, black hole physics um, and uh, then extended sort of motivated by the equivalence principle to looking just at accelerating um, detectors or accelerating systems versus yeah. inertial systems and recognizing this unitary equivalence. Mm -hmm. And then that, that posing a serious pragmatic difficulty in trying to interpret what's going on that really spurred a lot of physicists to develop these uh, models and provide some operational treatment of uh, what exactly is going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure what to say. That seems like uh, mm -hmm. uh, an eminently reasonable program to to mm -hmm. take on. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, that seems like the sort of thing that I think philosophers should be should be thinking about, um, particularly the historical development and sort of reasoning about um, moving to this sort of program and how that might compare. Uh, per perhaps uh, this is a contrast with Hogg's theorem, right, where Hogg's theorem is just too far removed from uh, thinking mm -hmm. about uh, connections like with you know, black holes, the sort of thing that moved us towards thinking about those sorts of situations. Um, that, that seems perfectly plausible to me, um, uh, in which case, um, perhaps what we want to say is like, I, I genuinely don't know, perhaps what we want to say here is, look, the foundational reasoning, the stuff that sort of led up to Hogg's theorem, frankly, just wasn't all that useful. Um, and so Hogg's theorem sort of is a capstone on a project that was not all that interesting. Um, that may be the case. Um, I don't know, but that those seem like the sorts of questions. I think what, what we've been trying to get at is these are the sorts of questions that uh, are going to be more fruitful uh, to think about, uh, at least you know, over in the philosophy department, as compared to like, what is the metaphysics of uh, the phi four model? Um, those don't seem especially interesting, um, at least to me. I, I can't speak for. David or Marion, but okay. Um, and then I'm not sure exactly if I have a clear thing to say about the no-go theorems, but um, uh, so so a lot of the well, no-go theorems to me seem like they're very useful in in sense of directing research, and I think this is an agreement with what you're saying. Directing research is supposed to challenge or question the underlying premises, as well as um, trying to make sense of the results within the context of that no-go theorem. So just as you're giving um, the example of uh, Arrow's uh, uh, no-go theorem, um, there are ways of getting around it, such as through these cardinal voting systems, which you listed in, in the mm -hmm. table. Um, mm -hmm. There is, I guess, the question about whether you can get around no-go theorems in physics, for instance, by sort of questioning the underlying assumptions there. Or maybe, um, and I, you gave the analogy of sort of toggling these different no-go theorems. There are ways you can sort of hold certain assumptions or, or sort of, um, uh, you know, say, okay, well, the, 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 the problematic assumption will just be this one, and we can have everything else fine. And there may be ways of then sort of juggling that around to, to get what you want is sort of what I took from it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are there sort of active um, attempts or, or, or are you drawing on like particular examples in physics that, that uh, you have in mind on what people are doing? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, this is fairly early stages. So actually part of what um, 
Um, one thing that actually that would be super helpful is um, if any um, theorems that seem to fit the label no-go uh, come to mind uh, in physics, actually we'd be incredibly grateful uh, to have those sent over to us because um, this, that's exactly what we want to do is, is let's look more carefully at um, more recent developments. I think a lot of um, what my colleagues um, look at are you know, no-go theorems from 75 years ago. Um, and like, I don't know, are we going to pull that much of interest out of them? I think part of what we were trying to say with the Hogs theorem stuff is like, can we stop talking about this? Like, this is maybe not the best place to focus our energy. Um, so um, uh, if you have examples, I would love to look at them and see like, how are folks thinking about them? I think part of our motivation is like, look, I just, I know y'all are talking about these sorts of things um, in the lab, in discussion sections at uh, conferences, at the bar afterwards, like you're having conversations about um, these types of issues. And it seems to me that like, these are really interesting and really important conversations that often get left out of the published literature for for good reasons, I think, often, but um, uh, something worth discussing. So um, sort of dodging your question there, but I, I think ultimately, like, those are the sorts of things that, that we would like to do. So, um, and maybe it'll turn out that, like, you know, what we're suggesting here is just wrong, like, which, you know, fair enough. Um, what we're trying to do is figure out what is really going on here. So. Um, did, did you, Nico, have any questions? Or David? Oh, yeah, okay. um, no, I just, I agree that, um, the no-go theorem is very useful for um, challenging our assumptions. It's always been a very practical way of doing things, especially when you have a no-go theorem and a some sort of numerical result clashing together. It's always entertaining. Do you have a particular um, no-go theorem in mind when you say that? Uh, not off the top of my head. Okay. David, do you have anything to add to uh, what Chris what Chris is saying? Um, no, I think I luckily I I agree with everything Chris has said. I think, um, which is which is always a good sign. Um, I I could throw in another question if you want, but I I don't have anything to add as such. Oh yeah, we can have another question. That'd be good. Um, let me see. So I'm already quite familiar with this paper, Chris, as you might know. Um, but um, let me ask then, going a bit beyond it, let's suppose it's a few years' time and I'm a funding body and I've read our paper and I want to hire a philosopher to give me some advice on, okay, where should the funding go, right? Because at the end of the day, I think we hope that this plays into something practical as as we've said right about about what funding decisions are made and maybe it's not the philosopher's place to say something exactly that you should fund this program or not or ma maybe it is in some cases but but yeah what what general advice would you think we should we should give that kind of funding agency yeah uh good uh yeah so that is sort of the direction I think we're we're aiming at right like um um not necessarily you know I, I'm not saying that I want to or think it would be appropriate um for anyone uh, from philosophy to serve in that capacity um but yeah I think my think is is just that the more I hang out in um, these uh, circles, the more apparent it has seemed to me that um, we are making some quite substantial decisions 
that are not represented uh, within the publication itself. Um, and look, they may all be the right decision. Yeah. Um, however, uh, it seems to me there should be some outlet for uh, or kind of public representation of at least some of those discussions. Um, and so do philosophers play a role in that? I don't know, maybe, like maybe that's one way that this makes it into a, you know, a, a broader conversation. Um, but maybe it's that um, we make some adjustments to um, how funding is given or funding proposals are uh, instructed to be written, right? Like I think the model of, um, you need to give me something fairly concrete here as an outcome of your program can be actually pretty deleterious. Um, and maybe we look at like longer um, uh, grants um, or with fewer strings attached or, you know, any number of things, but these all seem relevant to me um, to how do we tackle some of these big problems in physics and really in science in general? Um, and uh, yeah, just seems to me like th these are conversations worth having. These are conversations worth having publicly. Um, these are conversations worth having where there is some kind of peer evaluation of um, the um, arguments being made. Like, these arguments have force. Um, why don't we have any way of scrutinizing them? Well, what, why don't we have more ways of, uh, of scrutinizing them? Um, and again, like they might all be right. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, David, but. Yeah, it, it more than answered it because obviously I, you know, we're, we're thinking tentatively here, but I, I was just curious as to what your thinking would, would take us down that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, I guess to throw out another question, like, um, I, I would be curious, Nico or Evan, like, do you see any way, um, perhaps even diverging from the suggestions David and I have made, um, do you see any utility to philosophers of physics um, being involved in physics? Like, the answer might be no. Um, So I, I, I would say yes. So uh, maybe that's a bit biased because I, I am reaching out to philosophers in physics. Um, but uh, you know, philosophy I think helps provide a a direction to go in physics that I feel a lot of physics it is um, sort of chasing what's in front of you, while philosophy gives you a bit of a the of of ability to sort of stop and look around and to really sort of understand where you are contextually and then to maybe orient yourself a bit better in your, your research direction and the research programs you you want to be pursuing. Um, there is, I think, a lot of short-sightedness from what I've seen in physics on how people are approaching things, which is sort of the obvious, the obvious questions that you want to tackle, um, but which may not and which are well-defined research programs in themselves, but which may not necessarily advance our understanding in a more holistic sense. It's just an advance of that research program in itself. And so for me, that's really where, where philosophy is uh, pretty useful. Nick, could you somewhat comforting to, to hear, but... <laughs> Nick, could you have anything to add? Um... Yeah, so I feel that one of the things that this this attitude of funding which you're talking about um, leads us to in physics is well, it's not entirely wrong, but it's um, we're always, as as Evan said, we're chasing what's in front of us and 
I think it's fair to say that we're getting close to the point where basically all the mathematical and numerical results of existing theories are, are getting close to being found. And so if they're not up to scratch, if there's something missing in that, in those modelings, um, better interaction between philosophers and physics, physicists would be fruitful. And it is an opinion which is shared because occasionally a physicist, no, oh, sorry, a, physicist, a philosopher will appear at some of our conferences and um, help broaden our perspectives. Um, but it's, I think it's fair to say that um, there will always be a, a, a disproportionate balance concerning the interactions between philosophers and physicists. Um, I think philosophers shouldn't be discouraged by the fact that they will always be outnumbered in these sorts of meetings. Um, but it's still very useful. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Unless there's any uh, last comments, uh, we can probably uh, wrap up here then. Okay. So. Thank you so much for um, coming and presenting, Chris. It was wonderful to have this discussion. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you both. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to everyone who uh, is, is here now and we'll watch later. So, yeah. Excellent.